I'm Kevin Ames, Director of Content here at PhotoFocus. Welcome to another Drobo Plus PhotoFocus webinar. Drobo, maker of protected storage enclosures, is committed to helping photographers and videographers not only safely store their digital imagery, but also to learn how to make it. Making the cut, practical video editing, is this edition's topic. I'm pleased to introduce award-winning writer, producer, director, Abba Shapiro. Abba worked for a wide range of commercial, corporate, and federal clients, including USA Today, NASCAR, the Associated Press, NASA, Univision, Major League Baseball, Showtime, Viacom, the Discovery Channel, and CNN. Abba is also a regular speaker at several international broadcasting conferences, including NAB, IBC, InterB, Photoshop World, and Adobe Max. Welcome, Abba. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. I appreciate that introduction, and thank you for having me on the show to talk about uh, the art of editing. Appreciate that. Um, what we're going to cover today, as a matter of fact, is not any of like the keystrokes, and it's not specific to any editing or nonlinear editor. It's really when to cut, how to cut, how to think like an editor, and hopefully I will give you some ideas on, one, how you can be better prepared to edit from the point of the shoot, as well as things you can do during the edit to create smoother edits or basically edits that are invisible. That's great. I'm really excited about getting this going. So uh, you've got several things that we're going to be doing. And um, let's start with the overview. Well, that's great. Let me go ahead. And I want to talk about some things. So, you know, this is uh, also my contact information. So feel free to uh, reach out uh, to tweet about this. But let's get started. Let's talk about what we're going to cover today. And the first thing is planning for the edit. And you know, there's lots of different ways to plan for the edit. As a matter of fact, in the time we have to do this webinar, trying to squeeze all of it in is going to be quite a challenge because there's so much you can learn about editing. So this is just going to be, you know, a little bit of a slice of information in the grand scheme of things. So we'll talk a little bit about planning for the edit. And then we're going to hop into, in this case, Adobe Premiere. But as I said earlier, that this is pretty much uh, application generic in that the skills I'll be talking about, you can do with Premiere, but you can also do it if you're cutting on Final Cut Pro 10, on uh, Resolve out of, from Blackmagic, or an Avid, or pretty much any editing program that is more of an advanced editing program that really lets you fine tune your edit. So don't think that just because we're working in Premiere that these techniques are something you cannot apply to whatever editing program you're using. And then we're gonna actually go into talking about when is the moment you should make the cut? I think that's the challenge sometimes, is like you're cutting, but it's like, Depending on your timing, a cut can work or not work. So we're gonna talk about some of the aesthetics there. We're gonna talk about something called split edits, which you can sometimes refer to as J cuts or L cuts, where the audio or the video leads the other. So you may cut to the video before the audio, and this smooths out the edit. We'll look at that, and then we'll look at some strategies of cutting to music, because when you cut to music, a lot of times you can get away with a lot. And then I'm gonna round out this with talking about some things you can do to become a better editor, just things you can do in your everyday life that are techniques that I've used to become a better editor. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is that preparatory stuff, which is before the edit, which is the shoot, some things to keep in mind. And I know we have a very high percentage of photographers who are migrating to doing video. So that's where I want to talk a little bit about some of the differences and some of the things. So, you know, before the edit, planning for the edit, what you're going to do. Um, this is uh, actually just a redundant slide. There we go. Uh, before the edit, the shoot, this is what I wanted to talk about. And as I said, the photographer versus or as a videographer. And there's some changes to think about because when you're moving from shooting stills to video, it, it does open up some challenges as well as opportunity. You know, with a, with a photograph, you're capturing a specific moment in time and you can look around that image, you can look around that picture and the whole experience is how you compose that one frame. Well, you know, with video, there's a lot more because now you're capturing a story and you're telling it with movement. You're doing it at 24 or 34 images per second and how you piece these together. So you need to start thinking a little differently when you're shooting as a videographer which is versus a photographer. 
Okay, so here's some things just to keep in mind. As I said before, you're capturing a moment versus continuous moments to tell a story, and a photograph is just one frame. So remember, video is meant to be a continuous experience. People rarely will rewind and watch something again. The idea is to start at moment A and take you all the way through moment Z, uh, whereas an image is that one frame. And something else that you have to deal with exclusively with video that you don't when you deal with a still image is sound and how sound can help smooth out an edit and things that sound will do to move your story forward. So just some things to keep in mind when you're thinking about that shoot. The other thing to keep in mind when you're doing video is that, you know, in photography, we often take a single image, or I'm sorry, we take multiple images just to get that perfect shot with the perfect, you know, moment in time. Well, in video, you are dealing with multiple moments in time, but also realize that you might want to do multiple takes, which is if you're doing an interview, you might re-interview and get the sound bite said a slightly different way because you're going to piece it together, or if you have an actor performing something. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, a lot of times as videographers, we're shooting live events, whether it's a wedding or whether it's a business event or just you know capturing something documentary style. So if you can't really ask them to do it over again. It's not like you can say, okay, that was a great wedding ceremony, but you know, can you do it again so I can get it from another angle? It's not gonna happen. But you can use multiple cameras. And you know, that's actually relatively inexpensive in the grand scheme of things. As a matter of fact, you know, a lot of times you might have a second camera that is your backup camera that you could be using to record video also from another angle. And it doesn't necessarily have to be manned. It just allows you to have another angle to cut to. So if you have that opportunity, even if it requires getting a second inexpensive camera, sometimes that will help you out when trying to tighten something up so you don't have the uh, the jump cuts. So being able to position that at multiple angles is really helpful. Now, a couple things to keep in mind when you're shooting, and a lot of times we're stepping into the idea of interviews, and I'm gonna be working with some footage today, uh, which is both, a, it's, a, it's a ballet dancer, and I've interviewed her, and then we shot some B-roll uh, in a couple of different locations and some stills, and we're trying to put it together in like a smooth little package. So when you're doing an interview, when you're talking to somebody, trying to get those sound bites, think about the edit while you're doing the interview, where you're going to get a good sound bite. You know, you're listening for that nugget, not a two minute story, but the 20 second sound bite, or maybe the two 10 second ones that you can in your head think, oh yeah, I bet I could put these two together. Okay. Cause sound bites need to be tight because if you're doing, you know, whether it's a three minute piece or a 60 minute piece, you don't want a long rambly story. You really want to make sure it's concise. And sometimes you can fix that in the edit, but sometimes it's better to just have the person say it again a little tighter. Okay, so those are things to keep in mind when you're doing the interview. And also when you're doing that, you should be listening to hear what they're talking about because you'll probably need some B-roll or some cutaways to work with. And this is important because if you're, they're talking about maybe when they were a child, in this case, when she was a child uh, starting in dance, maybe I'll ask her, do you have any photographs of yourself when you were younger that I could you know, scan and that I could put into my show? Or do I need to find something in the room? Maybe I need to cut to her hands uh, to cover up and edit. So keep that in mind, You know what kind of elements you might need to support that interview when you're doing it. And this is one of the key things to remember when doing an interview is don't step on the audio. You have to remember you need to leave room for it to, to cut. So if you're speaking with somebody and you can nod your head in acknowledgement, but don't say anything because your audio is gonna be heard and you're gonna go, oh, in the edit, you're gonna go, I can't believe that I've ruined that take by talking. And sometimes we get so excited, and when we normally have a conversation, we start speaking just as the other person is finishing and often step on that last word. So it's important to keep in mind that when somebody is telling you a story on an interview is that you can nod an acknowledgement to give that reinforcement that you're making the eye contact, but let them finish what they're saying before you start talking or else you won't have a clean edit point out. So that's a key thing to remember when dealing with interviews. And let's talk a little bit about sound in most environments. We don't think about sound normally as a photographer because you know there's no audio to an image, but with video, that is one of your concerns. And other than getting good quality audio, and we're not gonna even broach on that in this webinar, but think about some things that you might need for the edit. There's something called room tone where you actually record silence 
while everybody's sitting there in the room, because our bodies absorbs and reflect sound differently, of just this general sound of the room, because if you're cutting out maybe a chunk of audio, the absence of sound is actually very loud. People notice that. So a lot of times you need to put room tone in to cover that, and that's just nobody speaking at that moment in time. So sometimes I record 30 seconds of room tone at the beginning and the end of an interview because that allows me to put the sound of the room, maybe the air conditioning, or just the general presence in the room under an empty spot so you don't have that negative sound. And this is another thing to keep in mind, especially if you're recording a location, you know, an event or a wedding. You know, if there's a song, record the whole song. Just leave the camera rolling and get a bunch of B-roll. Don't keep starting and stopping because you might use that audio to do a musical interlude in your video. And if you keep starting and stopping, you won't have the entire song that's being played. So it's always good to get at least one of those so you have location sound. And then again, you know, always if you need to get additional audio, additional sound bites. Sometimes if you're doing interviews, you can get, you know, the audio without the video if you know you're going to cover it up with B-roll. So things to keep in mind with that. And now going back to some shooting strategies, and we're going to get into the edit in just a moment, is again, multiple cameras, very useful, even if it's an on-man one. A big thing that I like to recommend to folks, and I'm going to be showing you how you can leverage this in the edit, is shooting 4K video. A lot of the new cameras, even a lot of our cell phones, can shoot 4K video. That's ultra high definition. Yet we're distributing our videos usually in high def, 1920 by 1080. If you shoot in 4K, it's pretty much like shooting with a high resolution uh, still image where you can crop and not lose any detail. So if I shoot in 4K, which is basically four high definition images, I can zoom in to 200% and not lose any resolution and still get a sharp image. And what that allows me to do is several things. If I wanna make an edit, I can cut from a medium shot to a close up because I can just zoom in and I won't lose anything. Or if I'm recording a live event on stage, I can actually shoot it a little bit wider so I don't have to worry about chasing what's happening on stage and I can actually move my camera in the edit. So shooting 4K, uh, even though you may be putting out 1920 by 1080, is going to allow you a lot more latitude when you're editing. And then also keep in mind, if you are shooting B-roll, shooting cutaways, that you know a lot of times you, know, you don't know if you're going to need a zoom in or a zoom out. So do both. You know, start with a static shot, push into a close-up, hold, and then pull out. You know, an exterior of a building or something. Because then you don't have to say, oh, I need you know, the different style shots. Because you can't always play video back backwards because if there's cars or people walking, it's going to be obvious that that video is playing backwards. So things like that, panning left to right, then you should pan right to left. And also leave a little extra footage at the beginning and the end of your video shots because you might need to linger on them. So don't just like zoom in and stop the camera, okay? Zoom in and hold or zoom out and hold. As a matter of fact, you should hold at the beginning and the end of a zoom or a pan. It will give you a lot more latitude and you'll appreciate that when you're editing. So, okay, let's get ready to hop into Premiere. These are the things we're gonna cover. And let's talk about knowing where and when to cut. Now, before I get any further, you know, Drobo is sponsoring this. There's a contest that Kevin uh, talked about earlier. So I'm gonna let him uh, bring that information back to you. And then we're gonna hop into Premiere and I'm gonna talk about some editing strategies. Thanks, Abba. PhotoFocus and Drobo invite you to participate in a contest to celebrate World Photography Day. Right now, through August 15th, you can enter the contest, and here's how. Go to www.drobo.com slash impact photo contest to enter. The rules and everything you need to know are right on that page. The topic is impact, and the contest is open right now. The prizes are amazing, a total of $4,000 to first and second place. The first place winner receives the biggest, fastest Drobo ever made, the 8D, plus two Seagate Ironwolf hard drives, a Drobo 5N2 networked beyond RAID enclosure, and a Sigma Global Vision lens worth $1,000, along with a copy of the Retrospect backup software. Second place gets a Drobo 5D3 and Retrospect. The winners will be announced on World Photography Day, 
So go to Drobo.com Impact Photo Contest for details. Well, thank you for that, Kevin. And let's go ahead and, so this is Premiere. This is the timeline that we'll be working with. But I want to show you just the video that we will be kind of cutting. This is, you know, an in-progress piece. So let's go ahead and look at this getting started. As I said, it's a ballet dancer. So I'm going to play just a couple segments. I'm not going to play the full two minutes, just to give you an idea of what we will be creating. I'm Anna Russell. I'm a dancer from Crimea. And from my first ballet lesson, I remember it was in America. Okay, so there's one section, and then we have this piece we're going to cut into this piano area. Ballet song. And I also play the piano. So there's video, there's B roll. So let's go ahead and talk about some things that you might want to know or keep in mind when you're editing. So this is our sequence. I have, you know, the, the edits and the cuts here. If you haven't done a lot with the video, so these are my little video tracks. I have different audio here. This is music. If we look closely here uh, on the second row, this is her sound bite, her audio. And I'm blending this all together to create, hopefully, what will be a seamless interview video. That's about two or three minutes long. So let's take a quick look at some of our options. So the first thing you want to think about when editing is how you can avoid jump cuts or distracting cuts. This is not a very good frame to pause on. There we go. So let me go ahead and play this, and you'll see there's a jump as she goes from one topic to another, because this was actually recorded you know, much later in the day. So I needed to piece together these two different segments, and there's going to be a jump. From Crimea, I started answering you guys in... And I'll play that a little bit I'm more. Anna Russia. I'm a dancer from Crimea. I started answering you guys in Russia. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of a jump there. And I have a couple of ways to hide this. I can try to hide it with the edit. And we'll look at that in just a moment. Or sometimes, you know, you're just going to throw in a piece of B-roll, or in this case, a still image. And if I put that over the edit point, you'll notice that I'm not visually distracted from Crimea. I started answering you guys. And I have a choice for where I place this. I could do it over the two edits. I could even do it at the very start of the edit because the whole point is, is as I cut, and I can bring this full screen here. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, as long as I don't have it to the point where I'm seeing the edit, I can hide the edit. And some things to keep in mind as I would fine tune or tweak this, you can see here just from the audio waveform that there's a little bit of dead space. And if I played this and listened to it, the pause is a little bit too much. Let me bring this back again so you can see the video as well as your audio. I'm my dancer from Crimea. I started answering you. So I want it to be there to be no pause. So the first thing I might do is trim this out. And there's several ways to trim things. We're not going to actually go into the technical axis of trimming. But all I want you to look at is you can see that I'm tightening up the space between this one sound bite and the second sound bite. So now, even though visually, I'm not, I started answering you guys. You know, there's a jump. I can hide that very easily by knowing that there's B-roll. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier, that sometimes if I know I'm going to need to tie something together, then I'm going to need to think about what can I cover that with. So in this case, you said, oh, let's find some shots of you, uh, stills of you dancing or record that, and I can cover that over. So the cutaway is your number one way that you can hide and edit. So the idea is that you cut it so that the narration or the voiceover or the interview is consistent, and then you start tightening it and cleaning it up so that they don't notice there are edits. I'm going to go ahead and, and jump ahead a second here because I want to talk a little bit about general uh, editing and, and timing. So I have a before and after. So I knew I was going to cut together these three sequences. I have her foot here you know, moving, and then I have a wide shot. And I see I have the foot moving, and then she's going to turn around, and I like that. So that, in my mind, is a sequence that I want to cut. And so I'll lay those down in the timeline, but then I need to time it and fine tune it so that it goes smoothly. And again, you're making some aesthetic decisions here as you're editing. 
For instance, I could have started with the wide shot to establish this and then gone into the close up, but I was trying to create a little bit more mystery in the shot to make it a little more intriguing that the first thing they see are her feet and it has yet to reveal what the rest of the shot is. So that first shot or just what choice you put for the sequence of shot is very important to start with. So if I play this, you can see obviously that there's a lot of jumps. There's a little movement on the camera. So what I wanna do is I wanna be able to tighten this up so I'm cutting on action and that's the key thing. When you edit, you wanna edit on a point of action, in this case, her foot moving not a static shot. So, because your eye is naturally drawn to movement. So when I'm going here and I'm seeing the foot move, the next thing I'm gonna look for in the next shot, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, is where the movement is. And so there I have movement in her foot. So I can go here and arbitrarily move this over. And I don't necessarily have to be too precise. I want you to see the difference when I do this. And I can trim this. I'm gonna trim this a few different ways depending on the style that you like. Before I did what was called a ripple trim. But in this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna blade this. Or I'm gonna cut this. So I'm gonna hit the C key and I'm just gonna cut out that segment. Not necessarily the fastest way to do it, but you can see what I'm doing. I selected this one piece. I'm simply gonna delete it and then I can move this over. Okay, so that's a basic way of editing. You can actually do this all with keyboard shortcuts and save time, but I want you to see the concept here. So we have the foot moving, and it's pretty smooth. Now, if I want it to be precise, I can go right to that edit point. Okay, and that, I just need to turn a couple things on here so I can jump right to my edit points. There we go. So I can go right to that edit point, and if I wanted to, as I step between um, frames of video, I'll do that. I can see the motion of the foot and try to match that. Now the key thing is it's okay if I pick it up as it's going out, but I don't want to repeat action. So I can tighten this up a little bit and to make it smoother, but technically probably don't need to do that, but I could do a little bit of where I just take off a frame or two just to tighten that up. And I see that nice motion. Now let's jump back here and see how we can go to the third shot and why it's important to cut on action. So I go here and I could go to this you know, shot with the wide shot there and then I can try to match the action with her hand up. And I think I have a little extra video here. Let's see if I have that. Okay, so I'm gonna go here and if I cut this point, okay, I'm gonna just trim off the beginning. Okay, her hand's up here her hands up there, I try to do that match. And I want you to see why this doesn't work as well. Okay, I hit it play. And yes, the motion, even though I'm not precise, is pretty close. And even if I got it precise, that cut would jump out at me because there's no necessary movement. But if I cut it on movement, like the hand coming up, okay, so I pick it up there with the hand coming up and I have to extend this shot to see if I have that motion. And the important thing when you are matching action is you don't want to repeat action. So if I bring this over here, you're going to notice that her hand is, in a, is up and then it's lower. So our eye quickly catches repeat action. If we have less than perfect a perfect match, so I'm going to go back here and just see where her hand is. Okay, it's right up there. So if I bring that up, and even if it's a little higher, then I'll trim off the head here, okay? So if I look at this next to each other, oh, they're pretty close, but I'm gonna actually cheat and make it a little bit worse. Zoom in a little bit here, bring that back a little bit. Our brain will fill in if there is motion missing. So let me go ahead and just hit the play here. You can see this. And even at this point, I think that it's still too static. I really wanna pick it up here. Okay, so there's something that I would do. I could work this, but there was something called a roll edit. So depending on your edit system, you know, you can look up how to do it. You know, here in Premiere, I can just, you know, zoom in and grab the two sections with my trim tool. And I want the edit to happen here, okay, when her hand is coming up. So it's coming up there, and then I want to pick it up when it's down. So there we have motion. So this way, if I was watching this, the cut would be a lot smoother. So that cr is creating the edit that's smooth, 
But when you're looking at editing something, you're also watching it over time, okay? So in this case, I'm thinking, you know, that edit worked, but this shot just isn't on long enough for me to really appreciate what she's doing. I think I really want to do it on the turn. So using the same philosophy, I'm going to go ahead and just move this over so you can see what I'm doing. And I want it on the turn, so I pick it there. This is really a lot of action. This is great. So I'm going to do it even as she's finishing up her turn here. I'm going to trim off the head. Okay, I'm just going to take off the head of that shot so we start in the turn. And then we go back here and I'll extend this shot until, again, I see her turning. And she can even be going just into the turn. So now as we put these together and you look at this, I see a little, you notice your eye, even though it was subtle, there is a little bit of repeat action there. Okay, she's almost finished the turn here and she hasn't completed that. So the trick is when you're watching this is to start tweaking it so you can get the motion so it's similar. And this isn't gonna be exact match. If you look over here to the right side, she's not quite at that half waypoint yet, but her eyes will fill in that blank. And if I did the edit right, this should work. And as you can see, I now have fluid movement, okay? Whereas if I cut on before or after the action, my attention would be pointed to the fact that there is a cut. And the whole point is you want to make sure that you hide the edit point. So that's the key thing is always trying to cut on action. And it doesn't have to be precisely matching, but just be careful not to repeat the action because our brain will register that. The only time you want to do that is if you're doing like a Michael Bay movie and you have explosions and you're looking at them from like six angles. But when you're doing most videos, you don't want to repeat action unless you're going to make a statement, but you can actually remove a little bit of the movement and our brains will fill in those gaps. Now let's take a look at some other ways that you might be wanting to work on edits. And one of these is something I referred to earlier, and that is the split edit, or you'll hear it referred to as a J cut and an L cut. And I have a slide in just a moment that kind of will, you know, defined so you can easily remember what's the difference between a J cut and L cut. It's just really the direction. And the truth is, is that, you know, unless you're taking a test, you don't really have to know which is which. But the whole point is, is that a lot of times when you cut, you don't necessarily want to cut the video and audio at the same time. So take a look at this. We have her dancing. This is picking up from when she's dancing. And then she's going to start talking. I'm Anna Russell. I'm my dancer from... So... You know, this is nice, the edit kind of works, but it is a little abrupt. But what would be nicer and what is smoother, and you see this in television a lot, is if you actually start hearing the audio under the existing video, which mentally prepares us that we're gonna be going to an interview. So if I zoom in here, instead of cutting these simultaneously, what I wanna do is I want to extend my video over the interview, over the audio, okay? So, and this will make the sound of a, or the look of a J when you see this. So this is a J cut or the audio leads the video. Now, depending on your software, you will do this different ways, but all I'm gonna do in Premiere is I hold down the option key. So I only am working with the video and I just let the video of the first shot linger over her speaking. I can see that visually here. And then when I cut to her, it will be transparent to the viewer. So we'll play this back. I'm Anna Rushville. I'm my dancer from... And I might even want to push that a little bit more. Okay, a lot of times you'll see this on television. You'll hear the next scene before you see it. I'm Anna Rushville. I'm my dancer from Crimea. So this is in case of an interview, but a lot of times if you're switching locations, and you'll see this in television all the time, or in films all the time, is that, you know, in the old days when you were watching a movie, let's say the 50s, you know, you watch something, a Hitchcock from the 50s, great, great stuff. But the audience wasn't as, uh, not only say sophisticated, but they weren't trained to have these dramatic jumps in, in time and place. So you see somebody, they have to drive up to the building, you see them getting out of their car, walking into the building, going into the elevator, hitting the floor, the elevator opens and they step out into the office. The same thing done today is you see the person pulling up and then you hear the sound of the office and the ding of an elevator underneath the guy pulling up and then you can cut into the office of him stepping out of the elevator and people just take it for granted that everything else has happened before. So that's one of the advantages of letting the audio lead and that way it's great to transition to an interview or great to transition into another scene. And that would be referred to as a J cut. If we take a look, there's also something called an L cut, okay? And that's where you actually 
let the um, audio run into the next scene, and then you, but you're seeing the video sooner. So in other words, you cut to the video before. So if I look at this shot here, okay, so I am a, it's pretty abrupt with that bang of music there. Okay, so what I want to do is maybe I want to see her at the piano first. And of course, I would smooth out the audio. So I'm going to, again, just move it so that I see her at the piano while I'm hearing the other music. And then when she strikes that first note, strikes that first key, it's going to be smoother. So it's not that much of a surprise. Now, if I was really trying to refine the edit, what I probably would do is I would... Uh, bring the audio of one track down underneath. And I would let this go and let it fade out a little bit. I could easily, you know, just keyframe that out. And so now it's going uh, softer and it's preparing. And then I would go here and play back. So again, the whole idea of a split edit is to hide the edit. Sometimes you might want to do this if you're doing a narrative piece like a film and you want to cut to the reaction of the second person who has been listening while the first person still is talking. Because maybe that's more dramatic. Maybe that's more important to hear the reaction of the person listening than to see the action of the person talking. So keep in mind, J cuts and L cuts, very, very useful. And as I said, if you need to be able to uh, remember this, this is what you should keep in mind. You know, this is, you can, you can do a freeze frame of this, but basically a J cut is you hear the audio from the next shot before you see the video and an L cut is you actually see the video of the next shot before you hear the audio. So those are really useful ways to smooth things out. Let's go ahead and uh, I have these done already. You can see what these look like again. This is probably a little more fine-tuned. I'm Anna Rashlo. I'm my dancer from... So because we see her, uh, hear her first, it'll be a smooth transition. And then here with the piano, So, you know, and again, with editing, everything is your personal aesthetic. You know, stylistically, depending on how you cut the show, you may want that impact sound of the piano keys to be your edit point, or you may not want it to be as abrupt because you're looking for a smoother transition. So that's a key thing. I want to talk a little bit about trimming uh, to audio or cutting to audio, or cutting to music. We had talked about this. And then I want to talk a little bit about you know tightening up interviews and also shooting 4K, and then we'll open it up for some questions. So if I'm cutting to music, and a lot of times the nice thing is you can have a bunch of random shots, and if you cut it to the beat of the music, it works. Music is great for saving things. But there are some tricks to cutting on the beat of music. So the first thing I like to do whenever I'm working with music, and I'm gonna zoom in here, and you can look at my audio. As a matter of fact, I can make this full screen here. And let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Okay, there we go. So what I like to do when I'm gonna edit to the beat of a music is I wanna be able to know where those beats are. And sometimes you can see it, but other times you just have to play and listen. And what you wanna do is you wanna put markers on your audio. And most applications use the same keyboard shortcut, which is the M key, but you can check your application to see what it is. And I'm gonna play it and just feel the rhythm of the music. And I'm gonna tap the M key, which is gonna put markers on my audio. And now it's very easy for me to see where I wanna make my edit points. So let me go ahead and play this and I'm gonna tap the M key and you'll see markers show up. So what I've done here, and I didn't quite get the rhythm right at the beginning, uh, is I listened for that downbeat. And now what I can do very easily is because I have that, and let's go ahead and make this a little bit easier for you to see, I know I can cut on any of these cuts of any of these beats. And let me just trim off the beginning so we can see what that looks like. So now if I wanted to edit, I could throw a bunch of still images. I'm gonna throw some still images on here. And I think I might have uh, some elements here and I'll just throw these on. And I'm gonna just throw them in my timeline. There's lots of different tricks you can do, but I can see here that what I want is I wanna be editing on these little points. And I didn't do this necessarily the, the fastest way, but I can go ahead and I can shorten these 
and I can have these effects happen specifically on those edit points. Okay, so we can go back here, trim that, have that happen at that edit point, have this edit at this edit point, and these images are all way bigger than uh, my images would be, you know, it's 1920 by 1080. So you'll see these photographs are all really big. So a lot of times, and just as a, a, an FYI, depending on your edit system, uh, when you throw an image onto your timeline, it can either automatically scale it down or leave it at its full size. And in the case of still images, they're gonna be way bigger than your video. As a matter of fact, video is 1920 by 1080. It's about two megapixels. Whereas your camera probably shoots anywhere from 14 to say 40. Uh, with a lot of programs, you can automatically set it to uh, scale down. So now I scaled it down, and you'll notice on the beat of the music, you'll see the edits. As a matter of fact, I think I should tighten this one up here a little bit. Now uh, we'll just let that one go a little bit longer. And I just missed it. There we go. That's probably good enough for now. And the nice thing is, because I have the beats here, if I wanted to let something linger a little bit, I could. I could say, you know something, I like this shot, I'm gonna make it a little bit longer. And that's gonna, it doesn't have to always change on the beat, but this way you can see what the beats are. And there are some third-party plugins that you can get for your app, different applications that actually put markers on uh, musical beats if you don't have rhythm. But the idea is that you can just tap to the sound. And if I look at this whole sequence here, um, I actually have you know, this dancer and I could even do this with video still cutting on the music beats that I had put in. So here's an example of uh, my trimming to audio done. And we'll take a look at that. And if you notice, I tapped the music and I wanted, you know, I made a decision here. I wanted to see this cut longer and these are cut on the music beats. Now, if you notice, not only did the cuts happen on the beats that I wanted, but I did match action on those. So this was probably a little bit deeper, or a little trickier. Um, there are things you can do to get, you know, this. You can make the cut there and try to do the timing so it happens on the beat. But sometimes there are things, and this is something I just want you to file away because we're not going to talk about this in detail, is that once you put something into a sequence and you want them to line up, in addition to doing basic trimming, and there's ripple trims and regular trims and roll edits, which I talked about, and a roll edit is where you just move the edit point between two clips, but the duration of the two clips doesn't don't get any longer, is that there's also something called slip edits and slide edits. And that's something you can Google or we can cover in a later episode where you can actually move the in and out points of a clip at the same time so you can better match action in addition to matching where the musical beats are. And that's very, very useful. The other thing that I want to talk about, the last thing before we go to some questions, is I want to talk a little bit about shooting uh, 4K video, okay? and why I like to do it and some of the, uh, the benefits of that. So in the first case, we're gonna just go here. I have uh, just, this was an interview that I did that was done in 4K and when I dropped into my timeline. It's a 1080 timeline. And so as you can see, she scaled up a little bit too big. So what I would do is depending on the application is I would bring it in and in Premiere, I'm gonna just say uh, scale the frame size. So what I've technically done here is I've taken this high resolution image and I've scaled it down to 50% of its original size. You can actually uh, see that if I select this clip here and uh, my motion should say 50%. I think I did the wrong thing. Yeah, I wanna do set to frame size, sorry about that. So it's at 50%. So there I can have this wide shot or interview, but let's say I wanted to cut out this whole section here and I'm not even gonna listen, I'm gonna do it arbitrarily. I'm just gonna mark that point there, mark that out point here, and then just delete that in the middle. So now I have this cut where the audio is gonna be perfect. And I don't know if it's gonna be perfect because I'm just doing this arbitrarily. Being but you see there's kind of a jump. Being very quiet. Being As a matter of fact, even if I zoom in and I tighten this up a little bit, which is probably what I'm gonna to wanna to do, you can notice you go from the hands down there to, that's quite a jump. But because I shot this at 4K, 
right? this is one of the things I can do, instead of going to this from wide to wide, I can take it back to its original size or even, you know, what I want to do to reframe it. And all I'm doing is going over to the upper left hand corner of the screen in this case. And I'm just making it a little bit bigger and I can even position it. So now instead of going from a wide shot to a wide shot, I can easily cut from a wide shot to a close up. And you'll notice that the edit is somewhat transparent. To be very quiet, being worried that I would be. See, we didn't know that she, you know, she brings her hand into the frame. So it just feels like it's a continuous part from the previous section. So we've hidden that. And sometimes what you can do if, if even that's not close enough is once you do that from the wide shot to the medium or medium to close or vice versa, you can then go in and sometimes just tweak the video a little bit. Get your audio smooth, but go ahead and sometimes you might do a little bit of a J cut or an L cut just so that it's hidden even more. It would be very quiet. Being worked. Okay, so in that case, it's actually not hidden as much because I don't have that motion. You notice that the motion really helped, so it was ideal. But maybe if I let go right there, you're very quiet. Being worried that I would. So depending on the footage you have, being able to shoot an interview at 4K allows you to do some cuts. Where when you want to do a cut, a lot of times you can hide it by going from a medium to a close up or a wide shot to a medium shot because we are used to a change in size that we don't necessarily see that cut and we don't necessarily see that you tighten something up. In addition, another advantage of shooting something in 4K is that it allows you to reframe your shot just like you would with a photograph after the fact. So I shot this wide because I didn't know if she was going to move her hands out of the way. So I could just go in and just tweak it to where it's aesthetically the framing that I might want. But another thing that I can do is let's say she's talking and telling a story and I'm going to start it at this point here. And then I want it to zoom in. OK, I'm going to go ahead and show you a little more of my sequence. And so I can say, well, she talks to this point. But now she's saying something important. I want to zoom in. I can zoom in without losing resolution because I shot it at four times the resolution of HD, which is ultra high definition or 4K, which is double 1920 by 1080, which is 3840 by 2160. So I can start here. I lock in the position of where I want these keyframes. And then I can go ahead, move a little bit later. I think I might have turned one of my keyframes off, but let's go ahead and see if I did do that right. If not, I can tweak it. And then we go down here. So let's see if I have that move. So instead of me having to do a push and guessing when to do it and not being really steady on the camera, I can just do that in post. I felt like a dancer had to be very. And I felt like a dancer had to. Be and if I thought that was too fast, I could go ahead and move that so that it takes longer to get there. But as you can see, like a dancer had to be there. I can do my moves afterward. And sometimes if I'm doing an event, maybe it's panning from one person to the other or reframing the shot. So I tend to shoot at 4K and shoot a little bit wider. So that's some basic things that I like to do when I'm editing. I do want to point out a couple of things that you can uh, use to become a better editor advice that was given to me over time that I want to pass on to you. So let's jump back over to the keynote. There's our J cuts and L cuts. And this is some things to keep in mind to become a better editor. First of all, watch television without sound and listen to television without looking at the picture. Now, it does sound crazy. I don't say go watch TV intentionally and your roommates and, you know, partners think you're crazy. Why did you turn off the sound? But if you're sitting in a restaurant, if you're waiting for a plane, if you're sitting in a bar, you can often see a television without hearing it. And in that case, you cannot be distracted by the story and see how they're making the cuts, see how they're framing their shots. It's a great way to you know, learn. And commercials are great. They're basically 30 and 60 second movies. And you know, watching those without sound, awesome. The same thing about looking at something or not looking at it, but listening to it without watching it. Maybe you're in the kitchen making dinner, but the TV's on in the other room. Hear what is in the audio, what's in the sound bed. What really makes something stand out as being professional is when you have layers of sound. You know, you're working with, you know, what's the person talking, but there's music and maybe there's some ambience that you hear seagulls. Now you know they're at the beach. You know, you're listening for those cues 
And, uh, you know, the sound work that's done in an edit can be pretty complex, but sometimes just adding nuance can really take your show up to the next level. The other thing that I like to recommend is watch the extras, whether you, if you get the digital download of a movie or if you still buy DVDs or Blu-rays, is there's a lot of time where you have the director talking about why they did something or the music composer about why they did something, or they show you deleted scenes and they talk about why they deleted it that didn't move the story forward. So it's a great way to learn, you know, you know, without having to take a course by going back to college, you can actually learn why these people did things and then you can apply it to your own editing. This is probably the best piece of advice I was given when I studied film a millennia ago, but it's you should always cut before your audience expects it. A moment before, if they're expecting the edit, you're already too late. So you should, they shouldn't be anticipating that it's taking too long to get to that cut. You should cut a moment before. And then always keep in mind that less is more when you're cutting, that, you know, refine, cut, 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 take down, you always tend to want to do things too long. You're in love with all your shots, but you want to be able to really get to the essence of the story and let it move and let it flow. And then editing is all about refining. It's about getting the story in order, tightening it up, and then watching the flow, watching the rhythm. So you're watching it over and over again to the music, and maybe you will extend a shot or maybe you will change a cut point, but it's that refinement. It's not like I cut it, I tweak it, it's done. That's the easy part is that first cut. It's the refining that tends to make things that much better. And again, this is some of my contact information. Uh, feel free to, uh, if you have questions, I will try to answer them. I do get a lot of emails a day, but thank you so much for letting me share some of my knowledge and I'm gonna give it back to Kevin uh, in case there are questions or to talk a little bit more about the Drobo promotion that we're working with. Thank you, Abba. That was great, really good. We don't have any questions in the pod. Um, do you have any closing thoughts as far as a way that people can practice these edits? How do they shoot something that would give them a way of practicing this? Uh, that's a great question, Kevin. As a matter of fact, you know, the time to learn how to become a better editor is not when you're under the crunch to edit a show. Um, too much stress. What you should do is just go out, whether you can only shoot with your phone or you have a DSLR that shoots video or a mirrorless that shoots video, is just shoot some interviews, shoot some B-roll, find some music uh, that you can cut to. If, if it's for your own personal editing, you can use whatever song you want because you're not really sharing it. You don't have to worry about rights at that point because you just want to have some fun. I think the key is when you're trying to become a better editor, you should try to tell a story that's fun for you and keep it short and just practice these techniques. So you start off with doing a traditional cut and then you ask yourself, how can I make this better? How can I make this smoother? How can I make this more enjoyable? And then you can practice with that. So you can also, you know, there's some places where there's footage, you can use, you know, stock footage that you get from the web, but really go out and shoot something with your phone if you don't have a higher end camera. Uh, and uh, I'm a big fan of using tripods uh, and a big fan of shooting 4K. And then for music, there are plenty of places out there that you can license music from for when you're delivering something to a client, or there's even some things that you can just work with that you can free download music and work with it for personal use. Or if you give uh, um, a part of your video, you actually say who the composer was. Uh, Creative Commons, I think, uh, allows you to find music for that right, source. Right. Well, we don't want to get into copyrights today. We'll leave that topic for another time. Abba, thank you very much for being with us today on Photo Focus plus Drobo. And we're looking forward to having you all come back to another edition. Watch on photofocus.com for the announcements. I'm Kevin Ames. Have a really great day and have a lot of fun editing. <laughs>